unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth, and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Today, we're going to take our reading from Colossians chapter 3, the version amplified. This is what it says. If then you have been raised with Christ to a new life, thus sharing his resurrection, from the dead. He says, aim at and seek the rich eternal treasures that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And he says, and set your minds and keep them set on what is above the higher things, okay, not on the things that are on the earth. For as far as this world is concerned, you have died and your new real and I want you to emphasize that your new real life is hidden with Christ in God. And verse 4 says, And when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear in the splendor of his glory. Hallelujah. I love the things Paul shares touching the person of Christ when it comes to the book of Colossians. There are very, very amazing things. I have not seen him define Christ in the ways he defines Christ in the book of Colossians. Of course, in other aspects, there are different perceptions and facets of Christ, and each carries its uniqueness. But I want to indulge you with the Colossians experiences. There's a wonderful thing that I see there. Now, he begins with trying to address the believer, okay, who has been awakened to the reality of the resurrection with which we have in Christ because as he died, when he died, we died with him. And when he was raised, we were raised with him. So he says, you have been raised with Christ to a new life. He emphasizes that the life of Christianity has a newness to it. All right. Yes, many things around us stay old for a moment and some for quite some time. Many things around us stay old. All right. Certain things are constants when we receive Jesus Christ in the physical realm, I mean, all right? But when the Bible speaks of salvation, the Bible says he introduces you to a newness of life, thus sharing the resurrection from the dead. And because you are a new being, he tells you, seek and set your heart on eternal treasures that are above. He tells you, you have to set your mind on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. All right? This is a cardinal instruction for any man who has become born again. For if any man be in Christ, the Bible says, a new creation, the old is past and now the new, and all things are of God. Okay? Now he says, when you become born again, one of the cardinal commands of being born again, God says, there is a way your mind is supposed to be set. Okay? There is a setting you're supposed to adopt. And sadly, some of the things that we're still struggling with, even today as believers, is because even when we became born again, we have not set our minds in a certain way. He says one of the cardinal rules of walking the Christian life is to set your mind a certain way when you become born again. And I'll share with you the reason why Paul speaks to us that way, okay? He says, set your mind on things above, on the things that are higher, the higher stuff, all right, where Christ is seated. But when Paul tells us to set our mind somewhere, to configure the setting of our thoughts, our consciousness, the things we meditate and muse over, he's trying to invite us into a realm that is not physical. He's inviting us in a world that is not seen. We would call that the metaphysical world. The world that carries no physical form or physical substance or matter. But that doesn't mean that in that world there is no nature of form or there is no nature of substance. There is a form and nature of its own. It's not the kind of physical realm that you and I regard. Okay, So the world that our minds are supposed to be set on is not seen. Okay, 
and it's not supposed to be something that you relaxingly just appeal yourself and incline to. It is a cardinal command that you must set your mind on things above, higher. He says you must maintain a certain mentality. And as I continue sharing, I will show you that Paul really is trying to take us to a certain realm in the spirit where we, we can connect to the life of Christ and then consequently start to manifest that life. Okay, And this is the work that I want to take you into. When Paul is warning the church, he warns us of myths, philosophies, endless genealogies. And he says that you must keep away from these things. The Bible says because they minister questions to the hearts of their hearers, but not godly edification which is after faith. And that is now him speaking to his spiritual son. Those words are deep and I'll explain why. Because when you're talking about myths, genealogies, philosophies and all these things, they all appeal to the purity of reason. Okay? And I have always emphasized on different teachings. Sometimes the divide that sometimes shocks the Christian believer who He's trying to understand God, but only in the realm of reason, okay? Now, when we go to the world that is not seen, or the metaphysical world, when we start to relate with the world that is unseen, many people in the physical realm cannot understand. They cannot relate. They cannot connect people in the world, people who are not born again. This world is supposed to be understood by the person, you and I, who is a believer, who has been elevated and awakened to a certain consciousness. It does not mean that the people of this world through other ways cannot access the spirit realm, but they can only access it through the eye of deception. Okay, And because they access it through the eye of deception, they will forever live to define what is naturally real. Okay, The realities of men are faulted and flawed depending on the eye by which they see the realm that is not seen. Right? The realm that is not seen can only carry its purity of clarity through the knowledge of the truth. The men of this world only connect to what is empirically seen, something that can, by experience and senses, be proved. If it cannot be proved by experience or senses, it loses meaning. All right? And that is why we appear, or we could appear, to be dogmatic to the world outside. And what is a dogmatic? The constant insinuation of things, the constant assertion of words and opinions and mindsets of things that to them we might not be able to prove or they themselves cannot easily prove. So Christ becomes a very confusing factor to the people that are perishing. In fact, the Bible says that the gospel is foolishness to them that are perishing. But to us, which are saved, he says, is the power of God. Because when the Christian becomes born again, he is awakened into higher realms, all right? And he says, now, because you are awakened into those realms, you're not supposed to visit them. You're not supposed to simply connect to them through prayer. And I want to show you the era of the present church, to connect to them through fasting, no. You are supposed to set your minds to that world. It says that when you pray, when you fast, you pray as a man who is set in that world. You fast as a man who is set in that world. Whatsoever you do in your piety toward God is all done in the setting, in the mindset that you carry, the understanding of that world, the world that is not seen. All right? Now, in that world, you start to see that the reality of Christ starts to shape out. When Jesus Christ was on the face of his earth, when he did his earthly ministry, when he died and was raised from the dead, and he appears to his own, there is no biblical proof that he ever demonstrated the power of God through healing the sick, casting out devils and cleansing lepers to the public. We never saw that ever again. If I get time one day to share as I'm sharing about the present ministry of the Christ, you will see that there was a change, okay? And that change defined the rights of operation, this man had changed from one form of body terrestrial to another form of body celestial. And so there was a certain access that he could not be granted to function in the earth a certain way. But the Bible says that when he was among his own, the Bible says he revealed himself to his own. After Jesus' resurrection, the revelation stayed with his own. They saw him, they ate with him, they did everything with him, and he proved himself 
in a certain way, okay? In Acts chapter 1, verses 3, uh, if you will read again from the Amplified, the Bible says, after his resurrection, he says, and to them also he showed himself alive after his passion. The word there for passion is his sensible expression. His sensible expression, the way he felt sensibly they would understand him, Okay, because even though these were men of the spirit and had believed him, they were still men with the flesh, you understand? And so the Bible says he's suffering in the garden on the cross and by a series of many convincing demonstration, okay, unquestionable evidences and infallible proofs, the Bible says appearing to them during 40 days and talking to them about the things of the kingdom. So when we're talking about these infallible proofs, when we're talking about these unquestionable evidences, is there proof of, you know, healing the sick, casting out devils and cleansing lepers and stuff like that to the public? No. To his own, we don't really have an indicative experience of that manner of his revelation. But we start to see himself appearing to them with infallible proofs and evidences that are unquestionable through a certain way. And in fact, the emphasis here is that he was talking to them about the things of the kingdom. He had been translated. He could not have access to the earth as he had earlier with a physical body. The body with which he's resurrected was a different kind of body. And that's the body that is carried in glory. Because, you know, flesh, natural human flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. They all saw him going. And then he realizes that the challenge of this emphasis on this person would not be an easy feat for the people that are watching him or that had experienced him. Yes, they had believed because he had proved himself without number. But the emphasis was the teaching on the things of the kingdom of God. He emphasized the certain realm for their understanding. And in fact, as he's ascending, he said, you know what? Biggest instruction, tarry in Jerusalem until the spirit is come. He emphasized that. Tarry in Jerusalem until the Spirit is come. Why? Because he knows that unless by the Holy Spirit, it is not going to be an easy thing for them to understand. It's not going to be a simple thing for them to understand, except they have the aid of one who reveals uh, the person of Jesus Christ. And that is through the Holy Spirit. So Jesus ascends in heaven. Okay? And now we see the first group of people that are converted, that have been changed, that have been with him. And these people start congregating, okay, meeting in spaces, praying together. The Spirit has come upon them, and the men outside are confounded. Oh, we had every man speaking in our other tongues, you know, the mysteries, the wondrous works of God. And then in Jerusalem, Peter comes out the day of Pentecost. They asked him, what should we do? And the Spirit of God descends. They receive Christ as their Lord and Savior. And why? Because they had had men speaking in tongues, right? And that is how the church was birthed. From that time when Jesus ascends, there's a question. Who is Jesus and how can he be explained to those that must understand him? Okay? I can imagine, or you should put yourself in the shoes of those people to whom he has been revealed. They've seen him. You know, they've seen him ascend, and they're there. They have a certain substance, a certain reality in their spirit. They have received certain teachings, okay? They have received certain instructions concerning the things of the kingdom. And these are the things that are not really emphasized, okay? They are not really emphasized. Not everything about the life of the Christ was fully emphasized. And that's why I tell people that when you yield to the contemplation of these things, your mind would blow you as you start to sail through the most confusing things about this life. And not confusing in the sense that Christ is not simple or seeking to give men clarity, but confusing in the sense that for some people it would take too much for their minds to interpret. For example, you've heard of a story when John says that if the things that were done and written of Christ, they suppose that the books would not be enough, the books would not contain enough of the things that Christ taught and did. If we were to get the total sum of the life of this man and say, let us write books, John says that those books, the sizes of those books would be bigger than the earth is. In other words, there's a lot in words about the person of Christ, that only a man or a woman of the Spirit can only transverse through the purity of that relationship with Jesus Christ. The life of waiting on God and sitting at His feet, uh, the rest that brings the 
clear revelation of his person that words will never fully express. When we talk about Jesus, I don't think we'll ever have enough words to explain who this man is. And I believe that there are men and women somewhere who have had a glimpse of these realities. These are not things that would be so easy for people to understand. The Bible says that the volume of the books, if they were to be written of him, the things Jesus did, the things he taught, even the earth would not be enough to contain, both in probably the volume physical and the authority with which this man ministered. The teaching of Christ is bigger than just what we read in the Bible. It's bigger than just what some men could share concerning their knowledge in the mystery. And some, like Paul, were humble to express that. He says, and these things have I written, that you might know my knowledge in the mystery. Okay? My knowledge in the mystery. Sometimes he calls it my gospel. He's not saying that he is really the author of that gospel, but he's only saying that that was the part that was given him to lay the foundation. All right? But the building, the increase of that government, it has no end. It cannot... End. And that's the depth of the riches of the glory of Christ. And sometimes I want to provoke Christians to indulge that far in the realities of these things. I have seen and heard things so wonderful that sometimes I'm lost for words. And some I don't know whether I will ever have the opportunity to express. If some people only knew how deep, you know, how bottomless God is, it's an amazing thing to imagine. And it's such likeness. Again, we go to the 40 days he spends with his own after the resurrection. The Bible says he taught them about the things concerning the kingdom. But what we do not know is the fullness of all of those things that were taught. But all I know is that there was a certain consciousness that was birthed in their spirit. There was a certain reality that was shared in their hearts. And when I talk about consciousness, what do I mean? I mean the physical experiences that are birthed from some inward convictions, all right? And that's what I call a conscience. The reconciliation of the convictions of the inward that start to birth certain experiences. And when I'm talking about the experiences, I'm not just talking about only physical, but even there are spiritual experiences that are birthed from certain convictions, certain instructions, certain commands that are laid in our hearts even as we wait on God. Okay? So these people are awakened to a certain reality in the kingdom. And... Some don't believe Jesus was raised from the dead. In fact, that's the difference between Christianity and many religions, and we will not blame them. And when it gets even into the science of things, the biology of things, the philosophy of things, again, it even becomes a bit more complicated because where is the proof of that? Can you explain it in a way that can easily be understood for certain people? And then sadly, even though we preach the gospel, Christ has to find a place of revealing himself to a man in a certain way for them to receive him. That is why it's foolishness to them that are perishing. Not everything we're speaking or you're hearing or you relate with makes sense. But for us who know him, it works. It works. So because he emphasizes the teaching of the kingdom, it's where now Paul comes to Colossians and says, look, if you look at the 40 days, there was a certain setting that the Christ was trying to build in the minds of these people. Because he knows it's only by that that they can continue proving before the whole world empirically, okay, by physical proof and experience, the reality of the Christ. And they did reveal him. The lame walked, the blind were seeing, the deaf heard, the dead were raised, they were elevated into spaces that were uncommon. We saw men appearing and disappearing in the flesh to minister to eunuchs. We saw men that walked the earth as their shadows were cast on the sick, the crippled, uh, the maimed, the dead. And as the Bible says, as they were going through, as they brought the dead on their coaches and the shadow of Peter touched them, all right, they saw power. They saw the glory of God and these men woke up healed, right? We see that in the days of Paul. We see handkerchiefs, we see aprons touching him, going on the sick, all them that were 
possessed by devils, and the Bible says, and they were free. So, the church started to have a certain authenticity to prove the reality of Christ because they had transcended what men can define as natural. You see, this is what I believe. You cannot, for example, build a certain machine without assessing the substance of that machine, the kind of material that you would need to build that machine. Okay, If you're going to build a strong car, there's a sort of material that you need to build that car. For example, you cannot build a very strong car with just wood and hay. You need a certain kind of metal or carbon fiber, a certain material that is hard enough you know, to build a certain strength in that car. Okay, so yes, you can have the idea, you can have the vision of building that car, but the type of car defines the nature of reality that connects with the substance with which you build that car. And sometimes I tend to think and connect this to how the human mind is made. Can the human mind possess enough substance to understand God, to understand Christ, the reality, to understand the life of the Spirit, to understand the ways of the Spirit, to understand God's healing power, God's delivering power, to understand the wisdom of God, to understand the graces and mercies of God. And I can tell you, no. The human mind cannot be built to understand things that far. They are so far from the human mind. That is why Paul says that the carnal mind cannot, the natural man, receiveth not. The Amplified says the unborn again, the non-spiritual, the natural man, he says, does not accept or welcome or admit into his heart the gifts and teachings and the revelations of the Spirit of God, for they are folly, they are foolishness, they are meaningless, they are nonsense to him. And he says he is incapable of knowing them, or of progressively recognizing and understanding and becoming better acquainted with, because they are spiritually designed and estimated and appreciated. A carnal man can't. A man with a natural mind cannot understand when we talk about Jesus. They can't. They can't. Because they are limited in the understanding of reality. What is reality? What is real? Okay? They can only appeal to the senses, the things that their senses can connect to. When they touch something, say, oh, this is a chair. So for them, that's proof. All right? For them, that's proof. But that doesn't mean that only the physical things are true or provable. There are things that are physical, but they are provable too. It's a very far experience for a natural, unborn again, non-spiritual man to connect so what do I mean by non-spiritual? I mean, if a man is in the fallen state of being, the only way they can connect to God, the only way they can relate to God is to awaken the spirit of them. Okay? But what in the spiritual are we awakening? We are awakening your consciousness to the true reality of this life. The true reality. Okay? We are trying to push your heart and spirit and soul to understand that there are realities that are beyond what we see. Right now, governments are fighting with a pandemic. But they can only fight that pandemic in their reality. They can only fight that pandemic in their understanding, in their interpretation of things, in the science of things, in the biology of things. Yet the thing that they're dealing with you cannot see with your physical eye. And yet it's paralyzing empires, businesses, nations, you know, careers. Some entities have changed forever in the way they work. They'll never appear that way ever again. But the thing that the world is dealing with, they cannot see with their physical eyes. Okay? And in the best of their abilities, they are closing this, closing that, closing this. Even the church that is supposed to give them the answer because they cannot understand. It's hard for them to understand what the church can do if it gets together and starts to really pray. You see what I'm saying? If the body of Christ came together and really believed to pray, many of them cannot connect 
It's easy for science. It's easy for biology to explain. And that's okay with them because that's as far as they can go. Now, Paul comes to Colossians and tells you, sometimes we have a tendency, a weakness as believers, to see the sickness in the world, to see the poverty in the world, to see the challenges in the world, to see the testations in the world, to see the going-ins and going-outs of the world, the transactions of the world, and then our minds are degraded and they digress to how the men of this world think and see life. And many of us start to even approve the way the world sees life. Yet we are born again because we cannot separate fact from truth. And no wonder many believers are like the world. They look like the world. But I want you to know, to the world, you have died and been raised from Christ. It has to be clear in your heart. For as far, he says, as the world is concerned, you have died. For as far as the world is concerned. So when you become born again and translate from darkness into light, the whole world, the world of the things that are seen, is awakened to the consciousness that there is a new life. Creation is awakened to the consciousness that this is a man or a woman of the new life. You know, the trees, the bacteria, the viruses that are flowing in the air, they are awakened to the consciousness that this is a man of the new life. Only do we kill and destroy ourselves because we tend then to commit ourselves back into the thought processes of the world. And the things of this world now do not know how to deal with us or they think, are we confused about this man or this woman? When Paul emphasizes the setting of our minds on things above, on things higher, he means that our consciousness must always carry the reality of the things touching the kingdom of God. That, you know, will seem easy if you are only visiting these realities. But the constant exercise of the spirit to be set in the mind, to set your mind, that constant life of your spirit, to set your mind, to tune your mind to only one reality, all right? So in the fourth verse, then it says that now when Christ, because when our eyes are set there, we start to see Christ as a reality. We start to see Christ as our real life, okay? So it says when Christ, which is your life, will appear, all right? Will manifest himself, will fanero himself, will translate the things that are not seen into the manifestation of those things in the physical realm. He says, we shall appear with him in the splendor of his glory. What does the scripture mean? When you exercise yourself and set your mind constantly on the world that is not seen, but of the things touching this life and the kingdom, you start to realize that the only constant that is naturally real becomes Christ. Because by him all things were made. And through him nothing was made without him. Okay? Through him. So when Christ starts to come so real and clear, that reality of Christ starts to shed in your spirit. And it, you start to understand him in a certain unique way. The Bible says you will fanero with him. You will appear with him. That means there will be a transaction as he manifests himself to you through the Spirit. A transaction will take place where you will be able to manifest with him in the physical. Because for us, the primary manifestation of the Christ is not in the physical realm. For us, the primary manifestation of the Christ is in the spiritual. And that is where we connect to him and carry the natural reality. And as we behold that natural reality, we are able then to translate in appearance with Christ that the world will start to see that we and Christ are one. And that the things that he did while us on the earth in the body, we are able to do. And thank God he said, even more greater things shall we do because he's ascended. Okay, he's ascended. When you start to meditate on the reality of that transaction, that translation, that change as you continue, you know, indulging yourself in that life, you will see that to make a layman walk, 
will be a consciousness, a conviction of a divine instruction and experiences spiritual that will pour out into a physical experience. You will not struggle to heal a cancer, but rather cancer will heal because of the elevated consciousness. Things will start happening around you in ways that you are not able to define or determine because you will feel that power and life working through you in proving the reality of Christ's existence. If the church does not have that, we cannot preach the gospel effectively. That is why the church, the Bible says, works in signs, mighty miracles, and wonders. And as they taught the word, the Lord added unto them. He multiplies them. Why? Because we are able to tell people that Christ is alive and they can argue all they want. But we can manifest and appear with him in a way that they cannot doubt the saving power of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They cannot doubt. They cannot doubt. They cannot doubt. So God starts to do things through you that philosophy cannot reason, you know, mathematics cannot count, that, you know, science cannot explain, chemistry cannot prove, you know, physics cannot, because it is bigger than what their mind can connect. Because the human mind works in a way that even though it cannot understand the things that are spiritual, it can easily sense when something has happened and it's not natural. It can easily sense that this is not a natural occurrence. And then it starts to ask the question, if this is not in the natural order of things, then what is this? And that is when we start to preach to them about Jesus. It's when we start to teach about Jesus. One time a lady brought a little girl who was deaf in the ears some time back. Okay? And in one of those meetings, and I laid hands on the ears of this lady and her ears opened. Okay, and the mother asks, how did that happen? How did that happen? Now, the human mind is starting to understand that this is beyond natural. It is not science that has done it. Scientifically, she's not supposed to hear, but her ears have opened. Okay, now if somebody doubts that Jesus is alive and well, that he exists, that he walked the surface of his earth, and that he is life, okay, there it goes. We've demonstrated the power of God. Some might not believe through miracles. But even if they don't believe, at least we have the proof to those that care, to those that are being redeemed or saved, to prove that indeed there is a Christ. Now, this even starts to go beyond the demonstration of power. There are realities that qualify your authority in the spirit as you speak, that God can give you an articulation that is beyond words, no more human words, that gives power to the language with which you speak, that can easily translate even the hardest heart. It might appeal as though it's reasoning, but this transcends reasoning. It goes beyond, you know, even the best argument that a man could ever set. And those are the things that invite men to the saving knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. One time I went with an old couple, wonderful couple of ours, they are elders in the ministry. And there was this man who was uh, sickly. And so we went to evangelize, to share the word with him. Because he was a hard fellow. And they started to speak. And I was, you know, seated on the side, he was sick. So I was waiting that after they preached to him the gospel, I would lay hands on him and he'll be healed. So this wonderful couple continues to testify of God and they were speaking and in my heart I was praying and meditating and as they were speaking, for some reason the Spirit of God impressed me to close my eyes and in meditation and prayer, I'm listening as they're speaking and this man is there taking in and taking in and taking in. And something remarkable happened. It has lingered in my spirit for as long as I can remember. As they were sharing the word and I was closing my eyes, behold, eventually, a light a very strong light came into the room, right? And it flashed so hard 
bigger than any flash of camera I've ever seen. And it was, wah! And in just seconds, wah! And I saw it. And when I saw the light hit that room, immediately it shook me. I shuddered and I just came out of the meditation that I was. And the moment that light hits like that, I knew something had translated in the spirit. I turned to this man and he said, you know what? I'm ready to give my life to Christ. Now, for me, who was watching that, as this couple was testifying about Jesus Christ, I appreciated the power that translates a soul from darkness into light because I understood what this light really is. Because at the flash of that light, the man turns and says, I'm ready to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I don't know what was happening as they were speaking, but I could tell that the gospel is not mere talk. It is the power of God unto salvation. It is the power of God unto salvation. Because that was the ultimate miracle before my eyes. And immediately they led him to Christ and I laid hands on him. For me, that was my personal experience. Okay, That I walk my spirit deeper and, you know, elevated my consciousness deeper to Christ, our reality. It might not be your experience, but like he appeared in his own way to the disciples after his resurrection. God has a way of appearing to a man in his most sensible ways because he knows from where a man thinks. He knows how to explain to us in his most simplest way. We will not have all the same ways of his revelation. Some will have it differently. Some will have visitation. Some will have angelic. Some will just carry an understanding. Some will awaken to it. Some of you are listening to me. Nobody preached. You just woke up and something lit in your spirit and received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Some of you, it has been a process, a work in progress. Wherever we have been collected, we have now moved this far. Ebenezer, the Lord has brought us this far and our eyes every day behold the reality of Christ and as we continue to behold then we are able to appear with him in glory all right but Paul has given the simplest conviction of that appearance he says we can only appear and manifest ourselves as ministers of the gospel and appear with Christ with the manifestation and I love that he didn't use the word Jesus but he used Christ, which is the anointed one, the spiritual form of this word, okay? Watch the word Christ, our life. Christ, our life, okay? So he says the only way we will appear with the anointed one, our life, hallelujah, in his glory, is if we allow not to visit the spirit realm, not to simply connect to the metaphysical when we need or have a need, okay? but to allow ourselves through the exercising of our spirits and the reading of the word to set our minds on things above, on things that are not seen, but on things where Christ is seated on high, where he is. All right? I just gave you an answer. That you cannot appear in the glory of the resurrected Christ to manifest, to funeral him on the earthly, unless you have exercised your mind constantly to be set on things above, on the things touching the kingdom. You understand? That the judgments of your consciousness are all aligned to the things that are not seen, to the world that is not seen, but not just the unseen world, but where Christ is. Because as you continue to dig in the world that is not seen, Christ starts to become a reality. When Paul speaks of how Christ should dwell in our hearts through faith, it's not an easy thing to tell somebody that may Christ dwell in your hearts through faith. There he's talking to a believer. And how does faith come? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. This is for a believer. This is for a believer. Dwell abide permanently, make his home in you through faith. Then you get deeply and grounded in love that you'll know the height, the depth. Then you go deeper until the Bible says you become a body wholly filled and flooded with God himself. God himself. And this is by the Spirit. So what am I trying to tell you? From today, stop praying to get into the realm. 
Stop fasting to get into the realm. Stop reading the word so you get into the realm. That's a wrong mentality. You will have experiences of flaws and spiritual errors because you're not constant. God has called you to a constant relationship. God is saying, set your mind. Set your mind. Awaken a certain consciousness of your mind on things above. Okay, I'll give you an example. One time a friend comes to me and he tells me, you know, Apostle, my laptop was stolen last week. And I told him, oh, sorry. And he laughed and says, no, there's nothing to be sorry about. All things are ours and all are Christ's. Then he laughs it off and walks away. And I says, this is a mind this, that is set. This is a mind that is set a certain way. Imagine he had lost the laptop, but his consciousness, the setting of his mind, was on things above. All things are ours. He says, whether Apollos or Paul, of things present or things to come. He says, all are yours, and you are Christ's. And Christ is God's. Right Now, imagine... This fellow had lost something, but his mind was set a certain way. And I said, these are the people to whom Christ appears with in the splendor of his glory. And no wonder such people easily manifest Christ on the earth. They appear with him. The things and examples that they leave and people start to see them and say, when you see this lady, this man, you see Christ. But that is a deliberate mind of setting your mind on things that are above, things that are higher, things that are beyond the physical. Saints, let the things of this world not consume us. Some people have been so consumed with money. They have been so consumed about the getting. They've been so confused about the winning. They've been so consumed about the physical realm. There are people right now that are killing others just to get an extra amount of money or to win this deal or tender. That's the world. But a Christian cannot be like that. To the world, you are dead. It's only you that will incline back to carnality to tell the world that you are alive. But to the world, when it sees a child of light, it's conscious that this man is dead. You'll have many cars in this world if you want. But never set your heart on them. You build houses, God has promised. But never set your heart on them. The Bible says when riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Okay? And it's not only money. It's how even in our relationships, we worship our own more than God. There's many things in the earth that take us. You just have to look at how your life, your time is divided every day and you'll understand what I mean where your mind is every day it's where you are in the soul okay so what am I appealing may you get the full understanding of what it means to set your mind on things above it doesn't mean that we're not going to grow economies or do all of that. But everything we're going to do, the houses you build, the cars you'll drive, the relationships you'll have, you build for God. You marry for God. You raise children for God. You serve for God. You love for God. You study for God. You give yourself for God. You forgive for God. You relate for God. You reconcile for God. You do all things to the glory of God because your mind has a bigger setting. It has a higher setting. You know, no wonder some of us have failed to enter certain experiences in the world manifesting Christ a certain way. Because every time we are praying, we are alasting. We want to consume these things in our personal lusts. Our minds are not yet set on things higher. God wants to elevate you to a place where your marriage represents something higher than the world thinks. Your relationships represents some higher than the world things. Your business represents some higher than the world things. Your ministry represents a higher experience and life than the world things. Your children, your career, okay, your way of life, your service to God. For those of you who serve in the ministry, that it gets so higher that you never be carnal in your service. That you never allow the things of the earth to, you know, coagulate to convolute to confuse your service 
before God. He says, when you do that, when Christ, your real life, appears, every time he's indulging in the work on earth, you will appear with him. The nudging of divine purpose will always seek for a man to work with, and it will definitely work with you. Father, we thank you. Thank you for your word. We know by our natural mind we cannot. By your spirit we fully understand. And now our minds are set on things higher, on things touching the kingdom, on things for our service, on things for our purpose, on things for our assignment, on things for your heart, for the need of the hour, on things touching our responsibility in these days of testation. And only this we will do by your Spirit. Holy Spirit, help set a mind today and let it stay there. We'll be amazed at the things men will manifest. And right now, the sick are healing, the blind are seeing, the deaf are hearing, the dumb are speaking, tumors are disappearing, blood diseases are healing right now in the name of Jesus. Somebody is dealing with diabetes. God is healing you this very moment in the mighty name of Jesus. I speak to your finances. I speak to your relationships. I speak to your service as a minister or servant of God. I speak to everything you represent. That may God align you and that may you appear with him in Jesus' name. I've prayed and believed. Amen. If you're there and you're not born again, you have never given your life to Christ, I want to give you an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Receive a new nature and reality. Start to see the world in a different lens from where you see it from. And I want to invite you to that. I just ask you to pray with me right now. This simple word, say, Jesus, I thank you that you died and were raised for my glory. Tonight, with my heart, I believe with my mouth, confess you as Lord and Savior of my life. I am born again. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.